On Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Clayburg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. On Story, presented by Austin Film Festival. A look inside the creative process from today's leading writers and filmmakers. This week's On Story, the director behind Thank You for Smoking, Up in the Air, and Juno, Jason Reitman. Because I think at the end of the day, it's always instinct. It's always, you know, you don't know why you say anything until 10 years after you go, oh, that's right, that's why. <laughs> that's why I dated that person. And I feel like filmmaking is the same. It's only looking back that I go, okay, the heroes of my movies are the head lobbyist for Big Tobacco, a pregnant teenager, a guy who fires people for a living, a woman who's trying to break up a marriage. I mean, these are my heroes. In this episode, Jason Reitman traces his path from novice filmmaker to indie stalwart. I fell in love with movies from the get-go, from the second I saw a film. I uh, was making little short films with my dad's video camera uh, from moment one. Um, and the, the real difference for me was that it's, there was this moment when I was around 15 years old or 16 years old when... It somehow hit me that if you were the son of uh, a famous director, the presumption about you would be that you're an uh, you're a spoiled brat, that you have no talent, that you most likely have an alcohol or drug problem. And, and honestly, that scared me out of the idea of becoming a filmmaker. And, and when I went to college, I went pre-med, because uh, I was just kind of running from it. I was so terrified of being compared with my father, no matter how much I love movies. And look, again, I was um, I was a Cineplex kid, you know? You'd drop me off at noon and I would just go to, you know, movie after movie after movie. Uh, the only difference uh, with me is I was a rich kid, so I actually paid for all the movies I went to. Um, and, uh, but yeah, by the time I went to college, I went pre-med because I thought, you know, why would I become a, why try to become a filmmaker and either fail in a spotlight or succeed in my father's shadow. And he said, look, there's no more noble a profession in the world than being a doctor. And if you became a doctor, your mother and I, we'd be, we'd be over the moon. We'd be so proud of you. Uh, but I don't think there's enough magic in it for you. Uh, I think you need to find something with magic. You're a storyteller. You need to follow your heart and stop being so scared. And it was off of that conversation that um, I, I came back to L.A., I conned my way into USC. I literally kind of walked the head of admissions to her car and <laughs> talked her into letting me into the school. Uh, I, I literally said to her, help me come home. And she like, <laughs> and she bought that. Uh, and uh, and I, I started making short films within a year. It was around that time when I really kind of fell in love with film festivals and film festival movies. And suddenly it kind of hit me, oh, unlike every other art form, there's this truly democratic system. There's hundreds of film festivals, and for the price of an ambition fee, you can submit your film. And if it's good, it'll play, and if it's bad, it won't get in. And I can really kind of gauge if I'm any good at this thing. And I started making short films, and the first one got in about five festivals, but I got turned on by like a slew of them. And with each short film, I just got better and better. I think to be a filmmaker, you have to be, you have to have the ego and the presumption that you are ready to make a film even when you're not ready. Because the truth is, I wasn't ready. It was around that time that I wrote Thank You For Smoking. I wrote it really young, uh, but no one would like, no one wanted to make it. And I spent five more years directing short films, um, making commercials, some horrible commercials, <laughs> and, and becoming a better filmmaker. And, and thank God, I mean, if I, if I had gotten the opportunity to direct Thank You For Smoking when I wrote it, it wouldn't have been as good a film. I, I had so much to learn. And then I saw Slacker. I was like, what is this? I, I didn't kind of, I had to watch it a second time just to figure out what the hell I was watching. Um, and uh, I don't know, it's like the first time you, you taste something new. It just, it, 
it changed my DNA, you know? It, it, uh, it changed what I thought a film could be. My ideas about structure changed, my ideas about tone changed, my ideas about your relationship with the audience. I think, um, I think having grown up just watching studio films, being around studio films, I thought my only idea was, well, you just gotta make the audience happy, that's it, right? I mean, that's the only goal. And then uh, watching more thoughtful films, I started developing a different relationship with, okay, what, how do I wanna feel as an audience member? How do I want the audience to feel? Do I always want them to be happy? On Thank You For Smoking, I had read the book, I loved the book, and felt exactly as you did. The, the, the voice in, uh, in this book was so unique. I grew up, you know, I was in high school in the 90s where I felt that we lived in a complete nanny state. Everyone was scared of everything. And I, spent, I felt like I spent all of high school being warned about everything. To the point where I thought, really, does anyone not know that cigarettes are dangerous at this point? <laughs> And, uh, and I remember reading the book and feeling like, hallelujah, there's someone who gets what I think and what I feel and who has this, he had this brilliant sense of humor. You know, he's the son of William F. Buckley. He's really learned, grew up in DC, uh, knows his way inside and out uh, on politics, and yet had this libertarian, hilarious point of view. Together, we represent the chief spokespeople for the tobacco, alcohol, and firearms industries. We call ourselves the Mod Squad, M-O-D. Merchants of Death. So, my day's ruined. Why? Dateline's doing a segment on fetal alcohol syndrome. Thank you. Polly works for the Moderation Council. A casual drinker by the age of 14, Polly quickly developed a tolerance usually reserved for Irish dock workers. In our world, she's the woman that got the Pope to endorse red wine. And it was one of these things that, you know, I had, I had started to figure out what kind of director I wanted to be, but when I read that book, I went, oh, that's who I want to be as a filmmaker. And, and I remember I made uh, my, uh, I made In God We Trust, that short film that played here, it played a bunch of places, it got me an agent. And for the first time, it was kind of like, oh, wow, I could actually make a living at this. And he said, what do you want to do? And I think he meant like, what kind of like genre of films I wanted to make. <laughs> and I said, I want to make Thank You for Smoking. That's it, that's the only film I want to make. And he looked into the rights, and Mel Gibson owned the rights to Thank You for Smoking, because <laughs> originally Mel Gibson was going to star and direct in Thank. Uh, he was going to direct and star in Thank You for Smoking, and they had spent a lot of money hiring different writers to adapt that book, um, and spent millions of dollars. They had bought they had bought the rights out, uh, they had gone through options, and they had bought it out in perpetuity, and they had hired a series of writers. Um, and and, and a, a, a variety. I mean, broad comedy writers. Um, um, uh, oh God, uh, Roger Avery had written a draft, um, which had like lots of violence in it. And, um, and, and my agent said, this is gonna be really tough. Uh, they've spent about as much money as you would spend on the budget of this film, just trying to write a script. Wow. And it's just buried in debt at this point. And I think this is a very common thing in, in Hollywood is, you know, you think about your favorite book and you're like, why hasn't it been made into a movie? And it's like, well, it's because it got buried in so much money, it just doesn't make any sense anymore. And I feel like uh, often uh, properties and books are, are like, you know, being in a relationship where you get deep enough in, you're like, well, yes, if I put enough work in this, I could maybe make it, you know, function, but, or I could just break up and find somebody new. And, <laughs> and I think that's how people treat books. They're like, oh, well, well you know. Let's go find another one. And, uh, and I begged them to let me write it, and I wrote like 30 pages on spec over a weekend. And I said, this is the tone of what I'm thinking, and they liked that. And they hired me, and I wrote that script. Uh, and they, they dug the script, but uh, they couldn't find anyone to make it. No financing at all. No studio, no. Mini major, no. Independent. And it was finally, it was four years later, or four and a half years later, that my agent got a call one day from a guy named David Sachs who had co-created PayPal, and he and his partner sold PayPal to eBay for one and a half billion dollars, and they wanted to make movies. And these five partners each cut a check for a million dollars, and that's how Thank You For Smoking got made. <laughs> and those guys' names, one's name was Elon Musk, mm -hmm. one's guy named Peter Thiel, one of the creators of Facebook, uh, uh, David Sachs, uh, who went on to create genealogy.com. I mean, it was just, it was all these Silicon, Valley billionaires who, who made that movie. I really wanted to approach the idea of what is the moment that we grow up 
And why do there teenage girls who grow up so fast and 30 year old men who never grow up? And, uh, and I found that really compelling, but we always felt we were making kind of a, a tiny film and it just, um, we, for whatever reason, the year it came out and the, the, you know, the way the music landed, it just kind of hit a nerve. I mean, that's what's miraculous about that film is that that was the first thing she ever wrote. Uh -huh. And she just wrote a draft. I mean, she knew she had already written a book and she had her blog and she was a great writer, but she had never tried writing a script. And she went and she bought the, uh, the published script for Ghost World and went, okay, I get it. You put interior for interiors, you put X for exteriors, <laughs> and then you put some action, and I guess you put the character's name in the center and then the dialogue underneath. All right, I get this. And then she wrote a script and won an Oscar for it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she, uh, and it was amazing. And, it was, and, and she wrote it in the order. So the first scene in the script is the first scene she ever wrote. And the second scene in the script is the second scene she ever wrote. Uh, and what was amazing about that script wasn't uh, this dialogue. I think when people think about that movie now, they think of this kind of like chirpy, twee dialogue, um, and that's their association with the film. What made it so unusual was her action choices, her character choices, the movement choices. Um, uh, they were brave. Uh, here was a pregnant teenage girl who did not act like any pregnant teenage girl who was very blasé about her pregnancy. You know, we expect in every movie, uh, uh, particularly up until that moment, if a young girl gets pregnant, we're about to go through this kind of melodrama and harrowing after-school special and and she seemed so annoyed by her pregnancy. Yeah, what do you mean, don't I just have the thing, squeeze it on out and hand it over? Mark and Vanessa are willing to negotiate an open adoption. Well, wait, what does that mean? It means they'd send annual updates, photos, let Juno know how the baby is doing as he or she grows whoa, up. Whoa, no, 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 no. I don't want uh, photos or any kind of notification, you know? I mean, can't we just, like, kick this old school? You know, like, I, I stick the baby in a basket, send it your way, like Moses and the Reeds. And there was something delightful about that, and everyone around her wanted to take it seriously. And she's like, oh, would you please stop taking this stomach ache seriously? And, and then... And then she introduces you to two characters, uh, Mark Loring and Vanessa Loring, and you immediately go, oh wow, this Mark Loring guy seems really cool, and Vanessa Loring is a total pill. And right uh, at you know, the end of the, the beginning of the third act, the end of the second act, you swap so hard and so fast when he makes this quasi move on Juno and you fall in love with her. Yeah, well, have you ever been to a dance before? Dances are for nerds and squares. What are you? I don't know. Does it feel like there's something between us? <laughs> I'm leaving, Vanessa. What? You know, getting a place in the city, got it all planned. This is something I've been wanting to do for a long time. No. No? No, you definitely can't do that. That's one big fat sack of... No! It was those kinds of storytelling decisions that made me fall in love with Diablo as a writer. At the end of the day, honestly, once I get to set, it's the same thing. You know, uh, the only difference is I would check in with Diablo just to make sure there was something I, I didn't understand. Um, and sometimes it's something so simple and stupid. I didn't like, uh, and this is gonna sound idiotic, but I remember there was a moment where Juno threw up in an urn, and I was like, why is she throwing up? And Dial was like, she has morning sickness. Like, oh yeah, okay, I get that. <laughs> like, like, and I just didn't, you know, you know, sometimes things just don't hit you. And uh, uh, I'm limited, guys. Um, and, uh, but otherwise, at that point, I have to feel like I'm telling my story. And I have to kind of follow the instincts of why I wanted to tell that story. And it's, it's, it's kind of far too personal for me to be like, oh, this is my writing versus her writing. And uh, I'm probably benefited from the fact that I've always adapted someone else's book. So I feel like I've always been, to a certain extent, working with someone else's words and trying to f tell my own personal story through them. I'm strangely, I think, most proud of Young Adult because it's the most subversive of the films I've made, and uh, I'm really proud of the direction in it. 
and I'm really proud of the performances in it, and I just can't believe we made it. I mean, it's about a woman trying to ruin a marriage, and she gets really close but doesn't, and then it ends. Uh, you know, and I think that's amazing. Uh, I mean, there's honestly, it's funny. Um, I've never really wanted to do a director's cut on any of my movies. I think my movies are the director's cuts. Uh, but Young Adult is the only one where uh, there's part of me that wanted to end it just a tiny bit earlier. For those of you who've seen it, there's a, this scene, it's one of my favorite scenes in the movies, one of my favorite scenes I've ever directed, where um, Charlize's character sits down with Colette Wolfe, who plays the sister of Patton Oswalt's character. And Charlize has gotten to the point in the movie where any character normally does, where um, they've been acting some way through the whole film, something drastic happens, and it gives them the capacity to change. And in any normal movie, that's where they change, they become a better person and happy ending the credits roll. And in this movie, um, right at that moment where she has the capacity to change, Colette Wolf's character, a character from off on the side, convinces her not to change. I need to change, Sandra. No, you don't. What? You're the only person in Mercury who could write a book or wear a dress like that. I'm sure there's plenty of other people who could. Everyone here is fat and dumb. Don't say that. And you think so? Everyone wishes that they could be like you. And then, and Charlie's character says, thank you, I needed that. <laughs> and Colette Wolf then says, uh, Charlie says, I'm going back to Minneapolis. And Colette Wolf says, take me with you. And Charlie's responds, you're good here. Oh, I need to get back to Minneapolis. Take me with you. Excuse me? Take me with you. You know? To the mini apple. You're good here, Sandra. Oh. This part of me that's always wanted to go and credits. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when I made Labor Day, I was really making something that wasn't like me in any way. The shooting style wasn't like me, the music style wasn't like me, the tone, what it said. Um, and. And it was flat out rejected by, uh, by the audience. And, and it hurts at first. And then you have to stop and you think about, all right, okay, what happened here? Because uh, I was like, all right, this is a pretty well-made movie. I, look, I can look at it and go, all right, you know, these performance is good. I think Eric, my DP, who I've known forever, you know, shot the shit out of it. And uh, Rolf Kent, who tried new musical things, he did a really good job. So what's going on here? And I realized it's just, it's not of my voice. And of the previous four films, even though there are differences, at the end of the day, um, I can feel myself in them. And in Labor Day, I don't. And, uh, and there was something kind of lovely about that failure in that it made me appreciate the fact that I had a voice and that the audience had connected with that voice. Um, and uh, their rejection of that movie was strangely in favor of the other things that were truer to who I am. I think uh, there's, a, you know, look, I think there's a strong running theme of parenting that goes through all my films. Um, how to be cynical and parent at the same time, I think. Uh, that's the book I'll write one day. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and starting with Thank You for Smoking, where Nick Naylor is the head lobbyist for Big Tobacco and trying to be a decent dad at the same time and teach his son things that he believes in and not ruin his son. Um, and it follows through in Juno, and even in Up in the Air, the relationship between uh, George Clooney and Anna Kendrick, you feel that kind of, uh, there is kind of a paper moonish kind of uh, father-daughter thing going on. So um, I think Labor Day had some of that, uh, had a lot of that stuff, frankly. I think that's probably what attracted to me, um, but it just didn't have the same bite. Episodic television is, that's totally new to me. Anyone here, I'm sure, you know, completely in love with what's been happening in television for the last five years or 10 years or so. And I, I wanted to try it. This is my first time in a room with five other great writers, all who had more television experience than I did, because I had none. And I would watch as one person would pitch an idea, it was a bad idea, and I would watch it move around the room, and it became a better idea until it was a great idea. With a film, all I'm ever thinking about is, what is the ending? How do you feel as you leave? That's kind of it. I mean, a film is a, is a magic trick that leads to a ta-da. Uh, and up in the air, George walks up to Vera's door, and she opens the door, and she's married. She has kids. It's 
So I was in the neighborhood. Everything in that movie is to get you to that door. And television doesn't work that way. Television is, how do I get you to the next episode? How do I keep you going? And at the end of the season, how do I get you to the next season? Uh, and it was the first time I was working on this concept of you know, multiple arcs that were happening across episodes. Um, and it's strange, I think, why the ends of television shows never really work. The final episode of a television show is never a, a memorable episode. We don't talk about those. We talk about these moments along the way because it's not really how they end. It's how they keep us going. You're clearly on a trajectory of characters that yeah. are unlikable. You have to love them. Yeah. And I do. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I don't think you can fake it. Mm -hmm. I, 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 think, uh, I think it's impossible to uh, to fake love, and and I do love those characters, and I love them for who they are and what they want to be, and and how they feel trapped uh, uh, in a world that kind of likes certain things and doesn't like certain things. I love Nick Naylor uh, from Thank You for Smoking for saying, "Really, are cigarettes haunting you at night? Are they tracking you down and trying to kill you? Um, don't we have some sense? Or do, don't we know how to parent?" And uh, and I loved. I loved Juno's attitude towards her pregnancy, and I loved Ryan Bingham uh, and his attitude on relationships, that we just go with this idea that, oh yes, in life we are supposed to find a, a partner and get married and be happy, and that's all there is to it. Uh, and Ryan Bingham says, well, maybe life is meant to be lived alone and always in flux, and there's all these ideas about building a home, and maybe there's something to that. And even if I don't agree, I love him for saying it. I love him for challenging people with that. Um, and then I love him being challenged back when he does fall in love. And he arrives at the door and finds out, no, this is what it feels like to be truly alone. Uh, and I loved Charlize's character in Young Adult. And that's the hardest one to love. And I guess I love her uh, the deepest and the most frightening way. I love her vanity. I recognize it. You know, uh, I love her desire to be loved by someone who doesn't love her. It's so scary. It's such a dark, dirty feeling. But most people know what that is. Um, and it's not stuff that gets heroized on screen often. But as long as I'm keying into that, all her behavior becomes clothing. It's not who she really is. We understand, even if we don't understand why she's doing it, uh, we can kind of fall in love with her. Uh, and, and I think that's it. I mean, I was surprised by the success of any of them because uh, one thing, again, that I really loved about the concept of independent filmmaking was it didn't have to be a success. Mm -hmm. You can make a film cheap enough that Financial success wasn't the goal. That if you said something interesting and if you created the film and said the thing you want to say, then you won. That was it. You succeeded. Uh, so with each one, it was never this kind of idea. Uh, it'd be, I mean, I want them to make the money back so that I can continue to make more films. If they could do a little bit better than that, then awesome. That means uh, that I'm people, the studios and investors are more likely to allow me to make a movie. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it, there's actually a strange pressure that comes with them being big success. I think it's instinct. And I think you get better by doing it. I can look at the writing I did in my teens, I can look at the writing I did in my 20s, and, and I saw how bad it was. I saw how off the mark it is. I mean, I feel like writing and directing is is making thousands or hundreds of thousands of decisions, and the question is, how long does it take you to get accurate uh, before the reader or the viewer feels exactly what you intended them to feel by virtue of all the micro decisions that you made? Not the big decisions, but all the little ones along the way. And through practice, you become more accurate. And then once you become accurate, the only question is, do you have anything to say? You've been watching a conversation with director Jason Reitman on On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story project, including the On Story PBS series, now streaming online, the On Story radio program and podcast in collaboration with Public Radio International, and the On Story book series available on Amazon. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com.